Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, uh, obviously, we're low on numbers again, and uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the COVID fears that are going on, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, but I'd like to recommend to you that uh, this week, look around and see who's here today. This week, call two or three people who aren't here and just invite them to come back and ask them to come back and check on them, see how they're doing. Um, you all have a church directory, and if you don't, let me know and I'll send you one. I send it out periodically. And just call a couple people and, and invite them to come back. Uh, I've been talking to other pastors who have said the same thing, that attendance in churches is very, very low yet because people are still reluctant to come back. And so um, uh, just give them a call and, and invite them back and, and we'll check in with folks. That'll be great. Do we have any announcements that we need to make this morning? I invite everyone every Sunday during our prayer time, if you would like to come up and kneel at the altar during prayer, please feel free to do that. Um, they say you're never closer to God than when you're on your knees. You know, and, and so if you would like to do that, that's fine. The other thing you can do, if you're able to, is to get up from your pew and turn around and kneel where you are. And just turn around and kneel on the pew. Uh, and that way you're on your knees praying. Um, I have done that many times myself. I, I love doing that. And um, so feel free to do that, you know. And, um, and during the service, if you want to say amen, that's fine. If you want to smile, it's allowed. Okay. Yes, yes. If you want to shout praise the Lord, feel free to do that. I mean, whatever. We're going to be talking about worship this morning, about what we do on Sunday morning. And I'm going to compare worship. I don't know how I'm going to pull this off, but I'm going to compare worship to a bright red sofa. And we'll figure out how it's going to work. Okay, we'll see. But, but worship is what we're going to talk about this morning. What do we do when we're here on Sunday morning? Why are we here? That's the kind of things we want to talk about because nobody's ever really taught us. We've been in church all our lives, most of us. We come to church and, and this is what we do. And, but we don't give it much thought about what are we really accomplishing? What is our real purpose for being here? So we're going to get into all that this morning. And, um, and I think it'll be fun to talk about it and, and see where it goes. So uh, thank you, Juanita. We will do that. Um, next Sunday, our church council is going to be meeting right after over in the annex, and they want to make a final decision about homecoming. Uh, there's still some, some fear and concern about gathering so many people together and having a meal and all that kind of thing with all the COVID concerns that remain. So um, there'll be a meeting next Sunday right after church. Begin our service to stand and join me for our call to worship. You will find it printed in the bulletin, and it will be on the screen, and we will read it responsively. Oh God, as we gather to worship you this morning, help us hear your still, small voice. Help us feel your gentle touch. Help us see your invisible presence around us. And most of all, help us find your joy. Help us find you in new and exciting ways this morning. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 73, Oh, Worship the King, the, number 73 in your hymnal, and the words will also be on your screen.
Father, as we have gathered in this place this morning, your children have come together. We've come together as your family to sit at your feet, to learn from you. But most importantly, Lord, we have gathered to give you our praise and our worship. Father, we thank you for another day of life, another day in which to enjoy what the gifts that you have given us and to enjoy living here in this little part of the kingdom where you have blessed us to be. And so, Father, we've gathered now, and, and as we gather, sometimes we're not sure what to do. Sometimes we're not sure what to say. So may your Holy Spirit, who we know is already here, may he lead us and guide us. Open our hearts and our minds to follow your leading so that in all that we do, we will indeed bring honor and glory to you this day. So come, Lord, lead us now as we worship you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I want to remind you about, uh, about our tithes and offerings. The offering plate is on your right as you go out the door this morning. And if you would leave your tithes and offerings there, we would really appreciate that. And as I say every Sunday, and I think I said last week, like we could record this and play it again on Sunday because I say it every week. But to those of you that are not here that are watching this on video, thank you also for sending in your tithes and offerings and for continuing to support not just our church, but to support the ministry that we have that's around the world. People are finding relief from their issues. They're finding Christ because you have been willing to give to him. So thank you for giving, and thank you for your faithfulness in your worship and your giving to Christ. So thank you for that. As we said, we're talking about worship this morning. And as we talk about worship, we always use this term called Sabbath. Well, what does Sabbath mean? What does it mean? It, maybe it's not exactly what you think it means. We don't know. But old Chuck is here today, and Chuck is going to explain to us, only as he can, <laughs> what Sabbath is. So let's, let's learn from what Chuck has to say this morning. Middle English variant of Sabbath. Sabbath? Huh. Old English, Latin, sab sabbatum, sabbatum, Hebrew, shabbat. Sh okay, you caught me, didn't you? I thought we talked about saying action, so I know when the camera's rolling. Action. Good timing. Great work. And you, you didn't think I use a dictionary for all those complicated words I help you with? I was one of those kids that was like, Mom, what does supercilious mean? And she'd say, look it up. And I would but I digress. Uh, so I was looking up uh, Sabbath in the dictionary because I'm a little bit confused. Uh, and the dictionary uh, defines the Sabbath as the seventh day of the week, Saturday, the day of rest and religious observance among Jews and Christians. Right? In the 20th chapter of Exodus, we are reminded, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Okay, got it, nailed it. But then there's a second definition listed right here, and it says Sabbath, the first day of the week, Sunday similarly observed by most Christians in the commemoration of the resurrection of Christ. Saturday is the Old Testament Sabbath. All right, that's a little bit confusing, but then there's a third definition. Any special day of prayer or rest resembling the Sabbath. That, my friends, is why we are talking about the Sabbath on this episode of Chuck Knows Church. After God did a bang up job creating heaven and earth in six days, very impressive by the way, the Bible states in Genesis on the seventh day, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. The noun form of the verb to rest is Shabbat, the Hebrew name for the Sabbath day, Shabbat. 
Therefore, we observe the Sabbath as a day of rest among Jews and Christians alike, with its roots firmly planted in creation itself. And in the Ten Commandments, it's very explicit about keeping the Sabbath. In Christianity, the idea of using the Sabbath for remembering the resurrection of Jesus, which was on a Sunday, led to designating the first day of the week as the Sabbath day of rest. But we also need to remember this. Jesus did not preach blind allegiance to observing the Sabbath. So Jews, according to the Old Testament, observe the seventh day, Saturday, and most Christians tend to recognize Sunday, the first day of the week, as the Sabbath. Hey! Do you think that has anything to do with why we go to church on Sunday? Hmm? Yeah. Sounds to me like another episode of Chuck Knows Church, because we are all out of time on this one. So there you go. Plus, I still think the, the supercilious just means to act you know, super silly. Maybe I should start my, my own dictionary, huh? Chuckster's Dictionary. Hmm, has a ring to it. If you'd like to know more about the Sabbath, be sure to ask your pastor. Tell them Chuck sent you. As only Chuck can. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's uh, kind of settle our hearts in and let's take some time. If you want to come and kneel at the altar rail this morning, you're certainly welcome to do that. If you've never done that before, I would, I would invite you to give it a try. Uh, just come on up and kneel while we pray if you feel you want to. And, um, but let's turn our hearts now toward our God as we join them together in prayer. Our dearest Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we stand in a long line of believers who have been faithful to you throughout the ages. You have led your people through trials and difficulties, and you've always set before them hope for today and hope for a better tomorrow. And as we face the trials of our current day and the ever-present threat of sickness and even death as a result of this virus that continues to rapidly spread across our land, we thank you for all that our leaders are doing to mitigate the effects of this virus. We thank you for the medical professionals, fire, EMS, and police who are on the front lines serving you and all of your people. Lord, give them the strength they need to keep moving forward and to keep serving as you have called them to do. And Lord, we ask this morning that you'll protect them and their families as they tirelessly pour themselves out to help others. Lord, we're reminded once again today that we can rely on you and that just as you have done for those who have gone before us, you will also lead us, your people, through the trials and the difficulties that we are currently facing. And you will also set before us hope for today and hope for a better tomorrow. Lord, bless your people in this time as, as we seek to be faithful to you and to each other. And just like those who have gone before us, and may we too know the faith which is filled with hope in things not seen. Give us a faith like the grain of mustard seed, which had small beginnings but which yielded large results. Give us the faith to move the mountains of difficulty which we are currently facing. Give us the faith that sees a distant goal and is willing to work with you and with each other to achieve it. Lord, give us a faith which has a vision of a new world where peace and love characterize the transactions of people and of nations and where there is war no more. Give us a faith such as Abraham's to move forward, not knowing our destination, but trusting in your guiding providence. Lord, give us a faith which is able to endure those moments of personal disquiet and to trust that you are with us. Give us a faith which sees the welfare of humankind as our business because it is the focus of your enduring love for your people. Give us a faith which sees beyond the years to an eternal city. And Lord, give us faith to walk with you through all that we are facing as well as through the victories and the defeats of life in your strength and in your power as we now pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. For our special music this morning, you, my, I know most of you are familiar with Jimmy Fortune. And uh, Jimmy Fortune is going to sing a song that he wrote called I Believe, and he's going to be singing it with uh, Daly and Vincent. Let's be blessed with Jimmy Fortune. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Jimmy Fortune has been around a long time, and he can still sing. Wow. Praise be to God. I'll tell you what, I've been blessed. I'm ready to go home. How about you? You know, just, <laughs> yeah. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament from 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 22. 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 22. And let's hear the word of God. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. And as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. And after he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the, excuse me, in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. And David said to Michael, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Where is he going with this this morning? Yeah. Yeah. Well, a while back, it wasn't but a few months ago, some friends of ours purchased a new sofa. And it was no big deal. I mean, you know, people buy sofas all the time. They'd been married for 38 years. And over the years, they had purchased many other sofas. But this one was different. It is functional. It set three people very comfortably. And it was a typical sofa except for one thing. It was red. It is glow-in-the-dark, knock-your-eyes-out knock red. And when it was delivered, my friend looked at his wife, the woman he thought he knew, the woman who's the love of his life, and he said, are you crazy? Why would you buy a red sofa? And she looked at him, and she smiled, and she said, isn't it awesome? And then she explained to him, she said, you know, when we first got married, all our furniture had been given to us. 
And she said, and then when they could afford to buy their first sofa, it had to be very practical because they had a baby on the way. And down through the years, all the sofas they had ever purchased down the road had to be durable and practical because they had three children and later they had three teenagers. But now the kids are grown and they're out on their own so she could buy any sofa she wanted. And she wanted the brightest, reddest sofa she could find. Oh, hey, it was still practical. It was still durable. It was treated to be stain resistant. It was on sale. And it was red. And during the few weeks after they purchased it, some of their friends came by. And, it hap- and the same thing happened every single time. The guys would look to their friend at him and they'd say, wife chose the sofa, huh? Yeah. And the women would stop dead in their tracks and they would smile because they understood. Yes, this red sofa was practical and it was comfortable, yet everyone who saw it had a strong reaction to it one way or another. It elicited an emotional response straight from everyone's heart. And friends, that's exactly what worshiping God should be all about. Now, you're going to have to stay with me here because, I, as I said, I'm going to try my best to connect a bright red sofa to worshiping God this morning. So we're going to see if I can pull this off, okay? But let me begin. I want to begin by asking you a question, and I want you to answer this. Why do we gather on Sunday morning for this thing that we call worship? Why do we do this? What is our purpose for coming here on Sunday mornings? I want to hear from you. What do you think? To to hear the Word of God. Yep. 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 Exactly. Yes. What else? Everlasting life. That's why we come here on Sunday to learn more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, what else? Nobody else knows anything about it. What, what else? What's that? Yeah, to, that's a big one. To encourage one another. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, what we do here on Sunday morning has to be practical, and it has to be functional. It needs to do what it's designed to do. But Sunday worship also needs to go way beyond the practical and the functional. Worship needs to stimulate us. We just watched that video of Jimmy Fortune. If that didn't stimulate you, you really need to start praying about that because God spoke to us through that video, you see. Worship needs to stimulate us. It needs to elicit a heartfelt emotional response from each one of us as we attend the service because that is what worshiping God is all about. And I think the problem comes in many of our churches today where the worship experience has become a brown or a blue or a beige sofa to the point where Sunday worship has become functional and practical and in many ways has become downright boring. I've been in churches before. I've been the guest preacher in churches where I stopped in the middle of the opening hymn and said, are you all dead or alive? When you, when you go in as a guest preacher, you can say things and get away with it, you know. Then the pastor has to do damage control. That's why I love doing that. Go out and preach revivals. Man, you can have fun with that. And then the preacher has to do all the damage control after you leave. But you see, and I remember asking people, why are you here? Why are you here? If it is so practical and so boring and it's so fundamental and it's so uh, quiet and everything, how much is it really honoring God? That's the question. Now, I realize that everyone has an idea about what Sunday worship should be, okay? In our consumer-oriented society, many people believe we should get what we pay for. (laughs) Yeah. Or at least we should be entertained by the pastor or the videos or by the music or, you know, anyone else who helps to lead worship. You know, we should be entertained by them or we expect worship to be an experience. Now, some of you might be able to relate to this. Listen to this. It, it might be an experience similar to pulling up the car to a gas pump and filling up our tank. We fill up the tank so we're ready for the week ahead. But friends, I want to tell you something. Sunday worship is about none of that. It's none of that. 
We don't come here on Sunday worship to get our tank filled or to get our batteries charged. Now, when we worship, that will happen, okay? I'm not discounting that. But if you come to church just because I want to get my batteries recharged or I want to fill up my tank to get me through the next week, you've come for the wrong reason. That will happen, okay? But what, Sunday worship is all about God's people gathering together to do what? To give, to give to God, to give him our praise. We come to demonstrate to God the overwhelming love and gratitude that we have for our God. You see, coming to church on Sunday, because if what, it's just simply what we do on Sunday morning, that's the habit we're into. We come in, and what do we do? We come in, and we sing a few songs, and, and we sing them like we're in pain, or we, we're singing glory be to God, and we got our head buried in the hymnal, and we look like we're in pain, or we're bored or something, you know, or in, and the words of which we don't remember 10 minutes later, you know. Then we pray a few prayers, we listen to the pastor, and we make sure we're done on time. Folks, that's not worship. That's called habit. And that's called ritual, you see? And that's not worship. Worshiping God doesn't even begin here on Sunday morning. It begins with a heart's that are overflowing with gratitude and thanksgiving and praise for all that God means to us, for all that God has done for us, for all that we are because of who God is. So then when we do gather on Sunday morning, when we do sing these songs of praise and we pray and we hear the word proclaimed, we're actually demonstrating. We're bringing that gratitude to God in a very special way way you know in our churches we say it ain't about us you know the church is not about us the church is all about the community it's about us coming together and then going out reaching out in the community for christ but you know something sunday morning in a way it really is about us it's about us gathering together hearts overflowing with love and gratitude for our God, and then giving our praise, showing God the love and the gratitude that we have for him. That's why you see each one of us, for each of us, Sunday worship needs to be a glow-in-the-dark, bright red sofa experience. It does. Functional, practical, working well, but a listening a, an emotional response within us that comes from the amount of love that we have for our God. Yeah. In our text today, King David, the mighty king, was leading a procession into Jerusalem. The Ark of the Covenant, which was a large box overlaid with gold and two golden angels with outstretched wings on, on top, kneeling face to face, the sacred Ten Commandments and some pieces of manna that God had used to feed the Israelites in the wilderness were inside. The Ark of the Covenant. It was the most sacred religious object that these Israelites had. The, the strongest reminder to them of who their God was. It was finally being brought back home to the city of David. Earlier it had been stolen during a battle, but now it had been recovered. And it was being returned to Jerusalem where it, had, where it had started and where it truly belonged. And King David, the king himself, the mighty king, led this processional. But for King David, this wasn't some solemn processional or some traditional ritual that needed to be honored. No, for King David, this, pro this processional was a celebration of worship. Time to celebrate time to rejoice in all that God had done for him and for the Israelites. So during this processional, King David found himself worshiping God in a very strong and passionate way. He stripped down to his underwear, <laughs> and uh, it was like a bathing suit that men wore under their robes at that time. And he sang and he danced in his street. Yeah, he sang and danced in the street in his underwear. Yeah, yeah. King David didn't care what it looked like. He didn't care what other people may have thought about it. He was worshiping his God, you see, with all his heart and his soul and his mind and his strength and worshiping God with all, giving God all, and that's all that mattered to him. And he did this all the way to the palace where he was met by his wife, Michael, 
who was not at all happy with her husband. Not at all. She said he was shameful and he embarrassed himself and his family. And our text today says she despised him in her heart. But let's be honest. She did have a point. I mean, really, she did have a point. Dancing in your underwear out in the street is probably not the best way to worship God, right? It's probably not the most effective way. But although she had a point, she missed the bigger point. She believed that worshiping God needed to be done in a certain way. It needed to look a certain way, you see. But King David believed that worshiping God should be all about passionately thanking and praising God regardless of how it may have looked to others. That is because, you see, worship, even for us today, is all about us, God's people, gathering together, spending time with God, celebrating God and his goodness to us. And that, that's why when I invite people to come to church, I've had people tell me on a regular basis, oh, I can worship God on the golf course. I can worship God while I'm out fishing. You ever had people say that to you? Sure you have. Yeah. And you know what I always say to them? When they say, I can worship God on the golf course or I can worship God while I'm fishing, and I look at them and I say, yeah, you can, but do you? Do you? Do you get down on your knees on the fifth green? Or do, you, or, or do you get down on your knees on the, on the bank of the river where you're fishing with your Bible and your hymnal? And do you get it, dedicate that time to God, to celebrating God's goodness to you with no interruption, with total and complete privacy, intentionally having one-on-one -on -one time with God? Do you do it? I didn't think so. You see, worship, true worship, begins with realizing who God is. It begins by realizing what God does for us every single day. I have often said, you want an, an interesting exercise? Get out a pad and a pen, and for an entire week, every time you think of something that God's done for you, write it down. And I will tell you this, you better get a big pad. Because when you start realizing what God's done for you every day, the list will go on and on and on because you will never come to an end of it. You see? So, so it begins by realizing these things and then coming before God in this special place together with God's people with overwhelming, grateful hearts, excuse me, overflowing with love and then just simply pouring it out to our God. Folks, I'm not talking about whether we worship in traditional or contemporary worship, you know, whether we use videos or live music or whether we use a piano or an organ or we have a hundred-piece orchestra, you know, none of that matters. You know, we don't worship formats and styles. We use these formats and styles as opportunities to worship in ways that are meaningful, in ways that people can relate to, and in ways that make God real to all people regardless of who they are and regardless of where they've come from. So, you want to truly worship God? Well, it begins by getting in touch with your faith. It begins by realizing who God is to you, what God has done for you, and who you are because of God. And then it means gathering in this place on Sunday mornings, praising God and thanking Him and pouring out your gratitude to God. Friends, this week, think about this. Pray about it, about what we've talked about here today. And beginning today, let your worship be like a bright red sofa that brings out the feelings and the emotions of love and gratitude and praise from the depths of your heart as you gather together to worship your God. Let's pray together for a moment. Father, we thank you so much for reminding us that we are here on Sundays because of you. We're here to meet you, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful gifts you've given us, the gift of this building and the gift of this congregation and our family of God, and we gather to see each other and to, to spend time with each other on Sunday mornings. And, Lord, we're just thankful for that gift. But the main reason we gather is you. We gather to worship you, to praise you, to pour out our, our hearts to you and, and great, be grateful and, and, and in praise and worship. So, Lord, show us how to do that. 
show us how to to break some old habits of just kind of hanging out waiting for the service to end or or maybe not paying attention to the words of the music or or just singing songs because that's what we do help us lord to use everything that we do here as praise to you as our gifts to you as we lift up lift you up in this place but especially as we lift you up in our hearts for it's in your name we pray amen amen Worship like a bright red sofa. Our hymn of response this morning is a great old hymn titled, All People That on Earth Do Dwell. It's number 75. The title may not sound familiar, but you'll know the tune. You'll know the song when we sing it. So let's stand together. Number 75, and the words will be on your screen. All people that on earth do dwell. Thank you again for being here this morning and for worshiping with us. It's been great to be in God's house with you and to spend this time, as we say all the time, together sitting at his feet and just worshiping him. I hope that we've given you something to think about this, this week, about what does it mean when I come to church? What do I do? How is my attitude? What am I expecting when I come to church on Sunday? Something for all of us to think about. And of course, the most important part is to pray about it and say, Lord, Am I missing anything? And if I am, reveal it to me because I want to worship you on Sundays. I want to worship you every day. But when we gather on Sunday, I want to worship you in ways that are meaningful to you, Lord, not just to me because it is, it's all about you. So I pray that you'll work on that this week and let God speak to you and let him, let him touch your heart. And as you go from this place now, go in his strength. Go in his love. Realize the love that he has for you and the, the strength that he gives you. Realize this week all that you are because of God in your life. And in all that you do, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in his peace.